Amen. All right, thanks, y'all. I think you have a fun lesson plan today with Miss Rachel. Is it Miss Rachel? Yes. It's your mama. Yeah. Yeah. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today comes from Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from the wedding canopy. And like a strong man runs its course with joy, its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making the wise simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired they than gold, even much fine than gold. Sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them is great reward. But who can detect one owns errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. I invite you to listen for the word of God as it comes to you this morning. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were selling cattle, sheep, and doves, as well as those in exchanging currency sitting there. He made a whip from ropes and chased them all out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins and overturned the tables of those who exchanged currency. He said to the dove sellers, get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Passion for your house consumes me. Then the Jewish leaders asked him, By what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous sign will you show us? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jewish leaders replied, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love and strength to follow on the path you set before us. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Today I am beginning a new sermon series titled Thoughts and Prayers. Back in the spring when I was soliciting your suggestion for sermons, this one was brought to me by David McCants, who had recently become aware of the number of different ways our very own Book of Common Worship lists the ways in which we can pray. The Book of Common Worship states, The Christian life is one of constant prayer, as the challenge of everyday discipleship requires daily disciplines of faith. Prayer is a way of opening ourselves to God. Prayer may take a variety of forms, such as mindful conversation with God, attentive and expectant silence, meditation on scripture, the use of service books, devotional aids, and visual art, and singing, dancing, labor, or physical exercise. Prayer may also be expressed in action through public witness and protest, deeds of compassion, and other forms of discipline service. I have long thought that prayer takes more form forms than what we typically think of as prayer, but there were a few on the list that surprised me, like exercise. But there were many that intrigued me and are worth our exploration, especially the one for today, and that is prayer as protest or public witness. This is an important one. I don't think I'm alone when I say I get tired and weary of people offering their thoughts and prayers in the face of injustice or yet another tragedy. Is it any wonder the phrase, offering my thoughts and prayers, has turned into a meme given how often it's said with absolutely no intent to take any action on the part of the one who's saying it. I mean, at some point, our prayers need to grow legs and take to the streets to protest, or grow arms and hands and start writing our legislatures. When bigots push their agenda, 
or another mass shooting happens or people are othered into submission or the earth groans under our weight. We need some hands and feet, heads and hearts, praying and working together. Frederick Douglass, one of the most forceful leaders of the abolition movement, briefly embraced Christianity but abandoned it because he observed that it did so little to soften the behavior of slave owners. He's attributed to saying that praying for freedom never did me any good till I started praying with my feet. Rabbi Abraham Heschel, a leading Jewish theologian of the 20th century who walked with Dr. King at Selma, said of that walk, for many of us, the march from Selma to Montgomery was about protest and prayer. Legs are not lips, and walking is not kneeling, and yet our legs uttered songs. Even without words, our march was worship. I felt my legs were praying. This is not to say that traditional prayer isn't important. It is. But it is also important to see that when we do something to make the world a better place, that is a really powerful prayer. Jesus' actions in the temple, in the story we heard today, show us the importance of embodying our prayers in tangible actions, especially in the face of injustice and oppression. When our story from John opens, it's Passover. Passover, as you know, is a high, holy time for Jews. People came from all over the area to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. If you were a faithful Jew, you made the pilgrimage no matter what. Jesus was a faithful Jew. So like everyone else, he came to Jerusalem to celebrate. And when he got there, he went to the temple because that's what you did. Now the temple was a magnificent place. Herod the Great had begun restoring it about 50 years before Jesus. It was sort of his way of placating his subjects. And the temple courtyard was open to anyone, even Gentiles. And it was sort of like a modern-day farmer's market. But this market included animals and money changers in addition to fruits and vegetables. And it was also a very noisy place because cattle and sheep and turtle doves and people and coins, they make a lot of noise. Now you might think, why is there a farmer's market in the front yard of the temple? Well, the market was necessary to keep the temple operating. For example, people had to pay a tax to the temple, and that tax had to be paid in temple currency. So money changers were necessary. You see, the normal currency had the image of the emperor on its coins, but because that image was not allowed in the temple, money changers were necessary. The same was true for animals. People were expected to sacrifice a blemish-free animal in the temple. So vendors sold animals outside the temple for people who had made the long trek to Jerusalem without one, or maybe those whose animal had gotten blemished during the trip. So the exchange of money and selling of animals was necessary to keep the temple operating. And in order to make it easier for people to do their necessary part to keep it running. That's why the courtyard was set up as a sort of convenience, if you will. But what Jesus saw that day, what got him so angry, was that while the, uh, the temple appeared to be fulfilling its purpose, closer inspection revealed that it had really lost its way. 
The people were offering their thoughts and prayers, but they didn't appear to be doing much of anything else. So when Jesus entered the temple that day and saw everything, he was outraged. So he made a whip, and moving through the market with it, he created holy chaos. He left no table unturned and nothing untouched. Out, all of you, get out of my father's house. You don't belong here. This doesn't belong here. Jesus was angry, very angry. Anyone who makes a whip and uses it in public in the way in which he did is angry. This is not the Jesus we like to meet. Generally, we prefer Jesus nice and sedated. The kind we meet in pictures in old Bibles. You know the one. The one who is surrounded by sheep and children and looks a little like your older brother with a beard. We like that Jesus. We understand that Jesus. We can relate to that Jesus. That Jesus is nice and kind and doesn't want to upset anyone. But in the Bible, we also meet a Jesus who is loud and prophetic and upsets the apple cart, literally. And while we may get a little on edge with that Jesus, there's something about him that we find attractive. We like to stand up and cheer when Jesus rights the wrongs of the world. We may even be tempted to take up a whip with him and denounce the money changers and sheep herders and anyone else who is doing the things they shouldn't be doing. And yet Jesus' anger is not really directed at the sheep herders or money changers. Jesus knew they were doing their job to keep the temple operating smoothly and assist the Passover worshipers. Nah, Jesus' anger is directed at all the people who had thought worship was enough and lived their lives the other six days of the week as if they'd slept in on the Sabbath who offered their thoughts and prayers when something horrible happened, but didn't do anything to prevent the horrible thing from happening again. Jesus' anger is a stark reminder that he came to challenge injustice. He didn't just upset the apple cart. He turned it upside down and right side out. The question for us today as we discern what this word of God means for us, is whether we're willing to harness our anger into action and take the same risks Jesus took to seek change. Are we willing to do more than just offer our thoughts and prayers? Can we take our prayers to the streets where they become protest? and public witness. This is both risky and vital. As someone once said, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. In moving from inclusive table fellowship to action against the temple, Jesus shifted from the controversial but more acceptable practice of eating with others across diverse socio-economic boundaries to confronting the institutional systems that create and entrench unequal and unjust socio-economic boundaries in the first place. Christian social justice advocate Jim Wallace likes to say, you can't just keep pulling bodies out of the river without sending someone upstream to see who or what is throwing them in. At some point, 
a Christian has got to stop offering their thoughts and prayers and take those thoughts and prayers to the courthouse to protest and overturn some tables. And while they're there, register voters, talk to their representatives, and give some money to their candidate or cause, too. John Dominic Crossan, in discussing this story, argues that if Jesus had just stuck to eating with sinners or the occasional healing on the Sabbath, he probably wouldn't have been crucified. But once he started messing around in the temple, he went too far, because that meant he was messing with the system. You see, it's one thing to donate food to the local food pantry, it's quite another to start changing the system that causes people to be poor and hungry in the first place. Because when you start doing more than offering empty thoughts and prayers, well, now you're messing around with people's livelihood, with my livelihood and your livelihood. And my guess is we like our livelihood just the way it is. Thank you very much. As Crossan says, those who live by compassion are often canonized. Those who live by justice are often crucified. Jesus was crucified. When his ministry moved from the periphery of power in Galilee to the center of power in Jerusalem. When he moved from small acts of compassion to an aggressive move against the system. He wasn't executed because he healed people on the Sabbath. He was executed because he preached one too many times that the healthcare system is broken and needs to be fixed and should be fixed because that's what God requires. And that's a message not everyone wants to hear. In the darkness of mass shootings, climate change, Me Too movements, and knees on necks, the Christian thing to do isn't to play nice. It's to get angry, really angry, and harness that anger towards good, holy work. As the bumper sticker says, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. So holding in mind Jesus' anger in the temple in the first century, as you look at our world in the 21st century, how is God calling you to turn your thoughts and prayers into meaningful action. Friends, God is faithful, but God also calls us to work faithfully and not sit idly by as the world is set on fire, literally. In other words, we are called to pray and to work. Don't just pray, though, as if it all depends on God, or just work as if it all depends on you. We are co-laborers with God, who throughout history has been working to make the world right and reconciling all things to him through Christ. The Apostle Paul urges us to work and do not be weary in doing what is right. What is right? Right is doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God. Micah 6, 8. What is right? Right is caring for orphans and widows in their distress. James 1, 27. What is right? Right is not mistreating or oppressing re resident aliens because you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Exodus 23, 9. What is right? Right is love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22, 39. What is right? Right is bringing good news to the poor, proclaiming release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and letting the oppressed go free. Luke 4, 18. This is the work of the Lord. And there is so much work to do. It is time to pray with our feet and heal with our hands and join the redemptive work God is doing in the world. 
Let us pray. God of peace, you have called us all to work for peace and justice. May we find opportunities to stand with people and identify with their needs and hopes. Where there is need, there is a task. When we speak out against injustice and for your kingdom, give us courage and the right words to say. Surround those who speak out with the warmth of your love and acceptance. When we offer healing and work for peace, give us gentleness and compassion. We thank you, God of love and justice, for all who have taken your command seriously to love others just as you have loved us. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or spirit for our affirmation of faith. We are a cloth of diverse colors. We are the people flowing forth from Creator God, surprising ourselves with the things which can be done. We are raw material for rewarding relationships as our lives interweave, contributing one to the other, holding each other firm when one is weak or breaking. We are each worthy of being respected and cared for, <clears throat> essential to the pattern, skilled in our appointed tasks, sources of laughter and shares of tears. We commit ourselves to work together that one day this world may be a place where all people live in justice, freedom, and peace. Our hymn is number 749, Come Live in the Light.
Amen. Please be seated. This week during chapel time with our day school, Brent and I taught the kids the song that proclaims the church is not a building, the church is the people. First Pres Fort Wayne is so blessed that you are a part of this family of people. Please take a moment to share that you are worshiping with us either online or in person by signing the, the friendship pads in the pews or clicking the attendance button on our website. If you've been visiting with us either in person or online and you'd like to become an official part of these people, please let me know by leaving a note in the friendship pads or in the comment section on the attendance form. The session is meeting on the evening of October 17th to welcome new members. We already have one family joining us that evening and we'd love to ensure all who are ready are included in on that fun. And don't forget to join us after worship today as we kick off and continue our Fine Arts Month, October. Brent will guide us on a tour that is not actually a crawl. We are going to be walking on both feet. We will meet up in the choir balcony at 1215 to go in, around, and through the pipe organ. Rumor has it we'll even be able to play it. So we invite you to pay close attention to the graphic in the bulletin that talks about this month full of opportunities to enrich your faith through the arts, which is a form of prayer, including a new musical in the theater, another music series concert, several tours around the building, and a pretzel-making class online with Annie. Email her if you'd like to attend that evening. And trust me, friends, I have taste-tested these pretzels and I'm already salivating. Speaking of salivating, tomorrow night is our monthly dinner group night. This is a wonderful way to connect with other members, people of this church, over food and fellowship. All are welcome at any of the three locations. So whether you attend the one at your favorite restaurant, the one that's closest to your home, or with my favorite, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, we hope that you'll join us tomorrow. There's so much more that I wish that I had time to share with you all, like Project 216 this Wednesday, 515 for pizza, 530 for, for meal packing, trick-or-treating on the 28th, the next installment of the Touchy Topics Book Club. There are books available in the Narthex. But we promised you the tour at 1215, and by golly, we're going to try to get you there on time. So I invite you to take your bulletin home today to, to look at it, to read it, to put it up on the fridge, whatever you need to do to know what's going on with the people in this community around you. Let us take a deep breath and turn our hearts and minds once again to God in prayer. Blessed are you, O God, God of all creation. In the beginning, you separated light from darkness and placed all your creative works in our hands. Today, we remember and give thanks. This beautiful morning, we bless you if you have blessed us. We stand with prophets, reformers, protesters, artists, saints, those who have lived, worked, spoken, prayed with their feet and their hands and loved us into being. Today we stand with authors of peace and justice, composers of community, designers of hope, choreographers of compassion, sculptors of simplicity, poets of forgiveness, knitters of humility, painters of hospitality, and gardeners of gratitude. Today we bless them as they have blessed us. And we pray for all of those in our hearts and minds who need your divine inspiration to carry them through illness, anxiety, fear, or grief. Be with them, cultivating a co-creation of compassion and care. Creative, creating God, your touch makes this world beautiful and holy inspire us illumine us and bless us with courage wisdom and imagination to use our hands hearts minds souls our feet our voices to be the best most creative and collaborating selves in our living and in our loving today and always 
as in one voice we come together the, to pray the prayer as Jesus, the table flipper, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we are called to be God's people, we have been inspired to co-create, to co-labor, collaborate in the world around us. Everywhere we look, we can see God's creativity in abundance, and we participate by giving a portion of our time, talents, and treasures, ensuring all of God's co-creators and collaborators are fed and clothed in love. Will the ushers please come forward to collect this morning's offering? Let us pray as printed in our bulletin. 
The wisdom of the world tells us to hoard what we own, O oh God, while you invite us to share what we have with those in need. Accept these gifts for your purposes, that we may be your servants in the world. Amen. Let us now join our voices together for our final hymn, Christ is Made, the Sure Foundation, number 394. If you are attending the um, organ tour, go ahead and grab a cup of coffee and then head upstairs to the balcony. You can take the elevator there, just go across the hall to and through the music room and that's gonna get you to the balcony. And don't forget Project 216 on Wednesday night. It is a wonderful opportunity to pack 10,000 meals in a couple of hours for a really good cause. All you need to do is sign up and show up and we'll, we'll put you to work, but 
encourage all of you to do that. It really is a fun time. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and bring you peace today and every day. Amen.